So this is uh, Forbidden Topics, uh, Lessons That'll Get You Criticized, Called Out, or Canceled. This is number six in that series, and it's entitled Pro-Life or Pro-Death, and it's the first part of this particular topic we're going to talk about. Well, let's face it, uh, no series of controversial topics would be complete or relevant if it did not include some discussion about the issue of abortion. Let's face it, I mean, that's a big uh, controversial issue in this country, so I wanted to talk about that. Here in the United States, on January the 22nd, 1973, the Supreme Court in a seven to two decision ruled that state law that banned abortions um, except to save the life of the mother was unconstitutional, thus legalizing abortion nationwide. Now, the legal reasoning behind the court's decision was that forcing women to go through an unwanted pregnancy violated the 14th amendment of the constitution, which guaranteed an individual's right to privacy. The argument basically said that the government forcing a woman to have a baby was an unconstitutional invasion of her privacy. That decision should only be made by the woman and her doctor. That was the legal theory. The moral argument was that the baby was part of the mother's body and only she had the right to choose what could or could not be done to her body. That was the moral argument that was made. Now the, um, the medical theory was that legal abortion lowered the number of deaths caused by illegal abortions and also brought down uh, death and pregnancy complications by allowing more research into providing safer abortion methods. Remember, these, this, was, this was the thinking in 1973. Those were the arguments that uh, were made to help pass this uh, decision. Of course, many disagreed with this law and began to educate and lobby for state laws that would limit or eliminate abortions altogether. And so from this, uh, the battle arose, uh, or from this battle rather, arose two opposing groups, pro-choice, who favored abortion, pro-life, who want abortion eliminated or severely limited to specific situations. Each of these is a kind of an umbrella for hundreds of different organizations who raise funds, lobby politicians, provide information, and uh, work um, uh, with pregnant women in trying to either facilitate their abortion or help them go through with their pregnancies and then help place the babies in foster care. In this brief you know, two-part lesson, I'd like to review a, what abortion is, two, some of the arguments for and against abortion, and of course, what does the Bible teach about this particular topic? So we start with the question, what is abortion? Well, the English word abortion comes from the Latin word abortus, which means to die. It is primarily used to describe a medical procedure where an unborn child is killed while still inside the mother. Now, abortions and miscarriages are different things. A miscarriage, of course, is when the unborn child dies of natural causes, such as various illnesses or improper positioning inside the mother or uh, an accident or illness on the mother's part, you know, but no one goes in and purposefully takes their life. They die of some, you know, an accident or an illness. That's, that's a mis, uh, miscarriage. An abortion, on the other hand, is the deliberate killing of the unborn baby by another person. There are a variety of abortion procedures depending on the developing 
or the development of the unborn child. Depending on how you know, old the child is, uh, different abortion methods are used. I'm not going to show any graphic pictures here, so not to worry, but I will describe the various methods. Uh, the first type uh, is the suction method. This is the most common form done uh, at about 10 weeks of development. A powerful vacuum uh, hose is inserted into the mother and the child is literally sucked out into pieces, vacuumed out of the, uh, out of the um, pregnant uh, woman. That's simply the suction method. Then you have a D and C method, dilation and curatage, at about maybe 12 weeks. This method uses a sharp loop uh, scalpel, uh, a steel, excuse me, a sharp loop shaped, rather, a steel knife. Uh, the surgeon uses this to um, enter into the uterus and literally cut the baby into pieces and then scrape it out. There's usually a, a lot of bleeding uh, involved in this method. Many who say women will be, you know, will use coat hangers, you know, to self-abort. That's, this is what they're referring to. They're going to try to do a, you know, a, a homemade uh, DNC uh, uh, abortion. Although this is a highly emotional example and argument, very few women actually try to uh, abort themselves in, in this way. Another type is salt poisoning, perhaps at the fourth month, fifth month. The baby is too big and too well formed for the suction method or the DNC method. So a saline solution is injected into the sac uh, which poisons the child and then the birth is forced to eject uh, the, um, the dead baby. Another uh, method is the D and E, dilation and extraction sometimes called the partial birth method. This is a late term abortion taking place in the 20 to 32 week period. The doctor guided by ultrasound will locate the baby's legs and pull it into the birth canal while it's alive. He will then insert scissors into the base of the baby's neck and puncture a hole in its brain and then a suction tube is inserted into the brain and the brains are sucked out of the baby. Afterward, the body is removed and discarded. This method was banned in 2003 and upheld in the Supreme Court in 2007. And then of course there's RU486, the abortion pill they call it, it's one of the newer methods, still being experimented with for early abortion. It causes the lining of the uterus to bleed profusely and dislodge the baby, thus causing its, uh, its death. So these are you know, pretty gruesome methods used to abort or cause the death uh, to unborn babies. Uh, these are not radical uh, pro-life emotional ideas. They are the reality of what happens when someone has an abortion. One of these methods is used uh, to take the life of the baby and to remove it. Now let's look at some of the reasons that people use to defend these practices and uh, a few responses to these uh, arguments. As gruesome as the procedures are, Millions of Americans defend and promote them under the pro-choice banner. Of course, they defend these actions with several arguments that I think, uh, uh, that I wish rather to describe and respond to at this time. There are really only five main arguments used to defend abortion on demand. And so in this first part of uh, the lesson, I, I want to explain some of these. One of the arguments is, well, the fetus is not human, so it's no big deal. This is why it is called a fetus, from the Latin word meaning offspring, rather than called a child or a baby. The point is that the abortionists claim that the fetus doesn't become viable, meaning doesn't become an actual living human being before a certain time. Until then, it's just a mass of cells and tissue. 
until it's human, there's no problem in eliminating it in any way that is convenient. Now this argument may have held some water, you know, hundred years ago, but today modern medicine has demonstrated how early uh, from conception, the human characteristics are developed and are obvious. For example, the heart begins to form on the 18th day. Uh, a regular pulse uh, is uh, felt on the 24th day. Uh, eyes form on the 19th day. Uh, by the first month, the baby will have had its greatest growth spurt in its entire lifetime. 10,000 10, times bigger than the fertilized egg. That's quite a growth spurt. By the 33rd day, the brain is forming and brain waves can be recorded by the 43rd day, that's six weeks. Now it's interesting to note that the lack of brain waves is what doctors often use to determine if a person is dead or not, but it isn't acknowledged as a sign that a person is actually alive or human enough to preserve by the pro-choice people. Now by the 10th week, the time of most abortions, the baby responds to touch, can move its feet, its head, its hands, its eyes, and its mouth. By the 13th week, the unborn child has everything that will be found in a full term baby. All that is left is development in size and formation. All it needs is food and time to grow into a fully developed human being. Now the idea that a fertilized egg is not a baby is true in that it doesn't look like a baby to the naked eye. However, modern science has shown us that very soon after conception, it does begin to look like a human being so that what is being aborted is something that looks and feels and acts like a human being. That old argument, you know, that, oh, it's just a mass of cells, it's nothing. Like I say, that worked 50 years ago, 60 years ago, but it doesn't, it doesn't fly today. This notion that in abortion, you're simply removing a mass of cells like a tumor or a growth and not a person is quite illogical. I mean, a tumor or growth, if left alone, will simply become a larger tumor or growth. Destroying it at any stage of growth is destroying what it essentially is, and that is a tumor or growth. Whether you, uh, you destroy it you know, uh, a week after you discover it, or you destroy it you know, uh, eight weeks after you uh, have discovered it, it's still a tumor. It doesn't change into anything else. A fertilized egg, however, is destined to be a person, a human being, and destroying it at any stage of its development destroys what it essentially is, and that is, it's a person. It's not a tumor, it's not a growth. Biologically speaking, a tumor is a tumor the moment it begins to form, and it will grow and develop into malignancy if left alone. But it will always be a tumor. It will never grow to become a child. You see what I'm saying? It won't evolve into a, into a human being. In the same way, a child is a child the moment it begins to form and develop into human form if left alone. But it will always be a child. It will never grow to be something else. In the history of mankind since Adam, Every time a woman got pregnant, the thing that came out of her was not a carrot or a tumor. <laughs> Every time she was pregnant, what came out was a baby, a female or a male baby. In the same way, a child is a child the moment it begins to form and develop into human form if left alone, but it will always be a child. When you remove a fetus at any stage of development, what you are doing is you are removing a child. 
because that's what it was from, that's what it was from the moment it was conceived. Remember I said, you know, women do not conceive cell masses. They don't conceive tumors. They conceive children every time. Now, sometimes those children are sick or they're malformed, you know, yes, but they're still human. Another popular argument is the argument of choice. The abortion lobby gave itself the name pro-choice to cover the, um, the real uh, issue of its movement. And that was the killing of the unborn. You know, that was not a marketing, uh, that was not an easy marketing uh, name, you know. The killing, what should we call ourselves? The killing of the unborn organization, you know. That wouldn't fly, it'd be hard to raise money if that was the name of your organization. So they used the term pro-choice. This term also describes one of its most sacred arguments, and that is the right of every woman to choose what will happen uh, to her body. Now this idea grew out of a legitimate complaint that women uh, had been traditionally uh, discriminated against and abused by society in general and by men specifically. Women wanted greater respect and fair treatment. They also wanted more uh, protection uh, from abusive males. Again, all legitimate and proper goals. To this cause, the abortionists added the right to choose to have a baby or not because a woman's body was her own and no one, especially a man, could force her to have a baby if she didn't want to have one. Now the problem with this argument is that it is partly true. A woman's body is her own and no one should force her to use it or abuse it in any way. I mean, none of us would you know, argue with that statement. The false part of that argument is thinking that a baby is part of her body. Once a child is conceived, it has its own body, completely different from her body. It has its own DNA, different from her uh, uh, DNA. The baby depends on the mother for food and so on and so forth, but is another human being living within her. It's a little bit like uh, an aged parent living with uh, one of her children uh, uh, and dependent on that uh, adult child for care and you know, uh, for their home and their transportation and all this and that, but they're still a separate human being. A woman can choose for her own body, but does not have the right to choose life or death for another person, even if that person is living within her. Again, the abortionists are so contradictory they fight for a female's right to rule over her own body, even if it means killing a female child in order to guarantee that right. Imagine, as a woman, I'm standing up for my rights and for the rights of women, and so therefore I choose to destroy the female child that's inside of me. That makes no sense whatsoever. So Western civilization, you know, we, we reject the ancient law of Roman uh, pater familias, where the father had right of life or death over their children. But with the pro-choice movement, we've substituted the equally abhorrent law of mater familias, where uh, women now have the role uh, and the sole choice of life or death over their unborn children to the point where a faithful and loving husband, let's just say, has no say whatsoever. Another argument, the well-being of the mother or the child. This is the most sensitive part of the debate because there are terrible circumstances that make abortion seem like a viable option. Sometimes a child is conceived through rape 
or incest or by a very young girl. You know, a very young girl is impregnated. Sometimes a child is destined to be born into uh, poverty or war or perhaps even a, an abusive home. Sometimes the abortion, uh, the unborn child itself is ill or deformed or perhaps mentally challenged. At times, uh, there is legitimate concern that the mother's life or, the long, or her long-term health will be at risk. Those are things that happen. Abortionists have one solution for all of these issues. Their solution is you terminate the life of the child, the most defenseless and innocent of the people concerned. Again, the mistake here is the idea that destroying the unborn child will somehow contribute to the well-being of the mother. Uh, we know it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't do it for the child who dies, that's for sure. In this country, the majority of uh, abortions are performed out of convenience, not concern. The clause in the abortion law that says that abortion is permitted for the health and well being of the mother can be and has been interpreted as perhaps too much stress or weight gain or a new baby would interfere with career or uh, an existing family is uh, you know, large enough, one more baby is too many. Now there are of course other times when there is a legitimate concern for the mother or the child. These are the situations where difficult decisions need to be made. In the case of rape or incest, which are rare, abortion doesn't remove the original violation. It merely adds another terrible violation to the list, the killing of an innocent child and more suffering for the mother. In the case of poverty or inconvenience or a dysfunctional home or society, since when has killing the innocent even reduced or solved the causes of any of these problems? Never, I never saw where abortion ever solved any of these problems, poverty, abuse. In the case of uh, a child who's deformed or ill, the abortionists can easily destroy because they measure the value of life by outward things, forgetting that every human being is created in God's image and therefore equally valuable and worthy of respect and protection and life, regardless of how they look or how healthy they are or how smart they're going to be. You know, in the case where the mother's life is in danger, again, which is very rare, we have a, a classic no-win situation here. It's the mother or the child. There are times when it is the mother or the child. Doctors will usually try to save the one that has the best chance of survival, which is in accordance with their training and ethics as physicians. In such cases, we can only throw ourselves on the mercy of God because you know, whatever we choose falls short of our goal to preserve life. But sometimes you know, you've just got to do what you got to do. It's like, like when, when there's war, at war, for example, and the medics go out, they have to do triage. They have to you know, treat the ones that they think have the best chance of survival and just ignore the others because they have just so much time, and so much materials to work with. One argument made also is that if we don't allow abortion, women will self-abort or they're going to go to back room abortionists and they're going to die. Well, before the Supreme Court ruled abortion legal in 1973, only 30 such cases were ever reported or recorded, 36. Not the thousands claimed by the abortionists in order to gain publicity and influence among the politicians and the judges on the court. Actually, there have been more injury, infertility, and death from abortions since then 
because more women have felt free to go ahead and have this dangerous procedure done to them. They make it sound like it's you know, going to get a perm or something. Yeah, no problem, you're in, you'll be out in the afternoon, take a day off from work, keep your legs up, you know, you'll be fine, really. The well-being of a woman is not served through abortion except in very, very rare situations. On the contrary, abortion is unnatural, it's violent, and it's psychologically as well as spiritually damaging to the woman. But they are rarely told this by pro-choice advocates. Now, I don't have time to you know, complete this uh, lesson that I've prepared on this uh, tonight. Um, uh, so I'm going to finish uh, the argument used by the pro-choice people and we'll review uh, what the Bible has to say about this issue and see what we can do about it in our own homes, in our own communities. We'll do that uh, next week. For now, I'd like to close this session uh, with a prayer for all those who, for whatever reason, have been through or been affected by abortion and have suffered because of it, you know. Men and women have suffered. Men because they permitted it or perhaps they talked their girlfriends or wives into it for whatever reason and then later on realized what they had done. There's no going back. And women who felt under pressure or they were depressed or frightened or whatever and went ahead and had their abortion and then later on realized the truth of what they had done. That type of pain, you know, it lasts a lifetime, a whole lifetime. People carry this burden, this sin on their hearts, you know. And even, even if, you know, they, uh, they become Christians and they're forgiven and uh, you know what I'm saying? And God forgives all sin, even abortion, you know, all sins are forgiven, you know. This particular sin, you know, it cuts very deeply into a person's heart and it continues to hurt for a long, long time uh, afterwards. So uh, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, and while I'm praying, let's think about those many uh, people who have been uh, hurt by this, who are still alive, obviously the, the fathers and the mothers, the men and the women, but also all of these uh, babies who, who uh, did not have a chance at life. Uh, you know, my, my only, uh, what's the word? Uh, the only thought I have that is comforting is that God uh, rescues those babies. Uh, he takes them, you know, that's his, he takes a portion, you know, the portion of, 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 of all of these people. Uh, he takes all of these uh, babies that were killed before they had a chance to live on this earth. They're with him. And some people have asked, well, you know, are they fully grown? Uh, you know, do they have, what kind of characteristic do they have? I don't know, That's, I, I have no idea, but I do know uh, that what is in a woman at conception is a, a human being being, you know, being developed. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that God, you know, puts his spirit in you or, you know, you're, 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 you're made in the image of God only when you're delivered. <laughs> and while you're inside the mother, you're, you're, you're not in the image of God. You're in the image of God from the moment of conception you're in the image of God. You know, David talks about God who, who made him inside of his mother's womb. I like to think that God makes all the babies inside a mother's womb. They're his babies. Even if some mothers and fathers have rejected those children, they're still God's babies. And I, I would hope that um, those who have had this experience uh, uh, 
uh, we'll find comfort in the fact that those babies are in heaven waiting for them. Those babies are in heaven waiting for them. And such is the power of God. Such is the power of the gospel. Such is the length and depth and breadth of the grace of God. Imagine, you do such a thing and your forgiveness includes the opportunity to see and know the person that you discarded long ago in another life. So let's, uh, let's think about all these things and uh, we'll have a, a word of prayer, shall we? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for having given us life and having preserved our life even to this moment, despite the various levels of health that each of us enjoy, Father. We know that uh, life is precious. We know that it is good. We know that uh, so long as uh, we are aware, Father, uh, we can give you thanks and we can take great comfort from the words that you give us in your word and the promises that you have made to us, Heavenly Father. So we thank you for all of these things that you've given us. We pray, Father, for the women who have uh, suffered uh, through uh, abortions. Uh, we pray for those who are blinded by the uh, lies of this world, who do not realize uh, the sinfulness of this act and the damage that it does, Father. We pray that they will uh, see the light. We pray for the babies, uh, Father, uh, who are inside mothers, even as we speak. We pray that you help all of these uh, mothers bring their children to term and decide to do that, Father, with joy and confidence in you. We even pray for the men, Father, who are the, the fathers of these children. We pray that they, uh, if they have ever participated in uh, abortions in some way, that they also will see uh, the light and, and, and acknowledge the uh, sinfulness of their actions and seek out your forgiveness, Father, and, and one day will uh, come into contact uh, with the children that they have not seen here on this earth. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity of sharing your word with others. I pray, Lord, that your word finds a place in all of our hearts. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for all those uh, who are having, will have, or are thinking about having children, I pray that you bless them and help them to have healthy babies, a healthy life, uh, Father. But most of all, I pray that you help them come to know Jesus Christ and the grace and mercy that is in him. Thank you again, Father, for your love and your kindness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.